The Tom Woods Show, episode 538. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody, if you've been meaning to start that blog or website, but you don't know what your first steps are, then check out the free ebook I created for you, taking you step by step through the process, including a free video tutorial showing you how to get a blog up and running in just five minutes. Plus, if you check out TomWoods.com slash publicity before starting up that blog, I'll give you some free publicity right out of the gate. So check it all out, the free ebook, the video tutorial, and the publicity offer at TomWoods.com slash publicity. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Tom Woods Show. Today's guest comes to us as a recommendation from our old friend Bob Higgs. I'm a friend of his on Facebook, and some time ago he posted that his friend Laurie Calhoun had a book coming out, and it sounded very interesting, so I looked into it, and I thought, yes, this is a definite for the show. And Bob helped me get in contact with her, and now we're able to have this wonderful program. Lori Calhoun is an author and research fellow of the Independent Institute, and she is the author most recently of We Kill Because We Can, From Soldiering to Assassination in the Drone Age. And the book is largely but not exclusively about the use of remote control killing of suspects with drones and the consequences and implications of that as a major ingredient of the war on terror. On our show notes page for today, tomwoods.com slash 538, I will be linking to Lori Calhoun's book, We Kill Because We Can. Also be linking to her Twitter and to her blog. So definitely check out today's show notes page. Lori, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. Nice to be here. Quite a provocative and in-your-face title. I love in-your-face titles. Just get to the point. (laughs) We Kill Because We Can is the main title, and the subtitle is From Soldiering to to Assassination in the Drone Age. This this thing is provocative from page one. So I I almost don't – there's so much – that I would like to ask you, and I want to make sure we do justice to the book. Of course, we're going to link to it on the show notes page, which today is tomwoods.com slash 538. But let's start off with just talking about the phenomenon of the use of drones and how they have gone from a peculiar oddball thing that was a curiosity in 2002 to being a very, very common instrument of U.S. foreign policy today. Yes, it's a little bit shocking in my view what has happened. Essentially, the lethal drones were used initially in covert operations. And what happened is they were used over and over and over again over about a 10-year period when the government did not acknowledge the use of lethal drones or targeted killing publicly. And by the time that 10-year period had elapsed, it had really become a standard operating procedure. So everyone in the administration thinks it's just a tool you reach for and this is how you deal with terrorism. Um, You probably heard uh, the Leon Panetta quote, it's the only game in town, uh, when he came into um, the directorship of the CIA. But the fact is we never debated any of this. We never had the debate because they were covert for so long. And then by the time Obama finally said in January of 2012, yeah, we're doing this, we're killing people uh, using lethal drones, everyone had already kind of accepted it and you know shrugged and just went on with what, whatever they were doing. Uh, with a few notable exceptions, for example, Rand Paul. <laughs> but but um, in terms of like a public debate among politicians, we never had it. Yeah, and now, as you say, it's uh, people don't even really. It's hardly even mentioned by anybody, and and that and that's true. That's a bipartisan thing. I don't hear Democrats talking about drones. No, you don't. And people have just accepted something like the New York Times headlines version of the story, which always says Sus- four suspected militants killed. And people are so used to reading that kind of headline. I think they actually elide the word suspected from their reading, and they just assume, oh good, we got some more terrorists. But the reality is, all of these people being killed are suspects. And so it's actually a very disturbing development in the history of warfare and in the history of, uh, I would say, criminal justice as well. It's really an amalgamated attempt to deal with terrorism and to say, on the one hand, these people are suspects, and on the other hand, they're soldiers, but we're just going to kill them without any due process, without... um, warning them without providing them with the opportunity to surrender. We're just going to kill them. Why? Because we can. 
Well, let me say what, of course, you know is the, the standard response to that, which is that we're dealing today with an especially wily non-state enemy. There is no headquarters that we can bomb, and then the regime will surrender and the hostilities will end. We're dealing with individuals, very shady, uh, change, always, ever-changing organizations. And so, unfortunately, it's going to be a little bit messy, and we have to do this. And if we weren't doing this... We would be doing something that you would find even more objectionable than drones. So shut up and accept it. Yeah, that is the standard line, well articulated. And my response is, first of all, the solution, the the choices are not a lethal drones or b tomahawk missiles. That's how it's always set up. We're, we have, either have to have a full scale invasion, take over Yemen, Pakistan, Somalia, Libya, Syria, take over all of them with our army, or we have to go in with drones. Uh, this is a false dichotomy. First of all, um, it's not the case that we would be going into any of these places beyond Iraq and Afghanistan with troops on the ground because the people are not posing uh, a huge threat to the United States. They're, they're small factions in tribal regions, and basically they're suspected of complicity in terrorism, but it's. I'm glad you raised the word shady because the sh the the evidence for these people's supposed guilt of plotting to destroy the United States is based on information provided by bribed locals, and we know from Guantanamo Bay when we used bribery bribery to pull in all these men and uh, incarcerate them without charges for many years that it turned out that 86% of those men were innocent. They had no actual connection to terrorist networks. They just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. What's happening with the lethal drones is that people, because we kill, don't capture, and take no prisoners, people want to assume that all these people are guilty. The reality is very different, I believe, based on the stats on Guantanamo Bay and the fact that the very same types of intelligence are used for drone strikes, as was used in rounding up suspects for detention. All right, so we have to extrapolate from a case like Guantanamo. Is that because we really don't have any way? Once, once people have been basically obliterated by a drone strike, there's no way to go in and assess who's who and what really happened, so we, we can't really form accurate percentages in terms of are we really getting terrorists? Are we able to assess those numbers? Well, that's an excellent question. And what has happened is the administration in one way acknowledges the difficulty of getting the truth, but their solution is not to be skeptical or agnostic about the identity of some of these people killed. Instead, what they've done is to define all men of military age who are killed in drone strikes as unlawful combatants and fair game for targeting. In other words, if you are an able-bodied male in one of these tribal regions where over which lethal drones hover and you are killed whether or not your name is known whether or not you have any known association with uh, al qaeda they they write you into history as an enemy c combatant killed in action and the the uh, you know they offer this kind of bizarre uh, explanation that well we assume that they are combatants unless we're given some, some reason not to believe uh, that they're combatants. But of course that never happens and it couldn't happen because the people are killed on the basis of suspicious activities, namely being where they are among other people whom, whom uh, have already been killed or are related in some way to Al Qaeda or some other group. And so there's no way for these people to be exonerated posthumously. They can't exonerate themselves pre-posthumously because they don't know that they're being hunted down to be killed. And many of them are not even on target list, but they end up getting killed because they're looking for someone else. They want to kill someone and they end up killing a, a cluster of other people. And then if the, if the people actually killed happen to be men of military age, they're written off as unlawful combatants. The very first one of these strikes apparently was in Yemen back in 2002. And I hadn't known the details of that till I read them in your book about the complicity of the president of Yemen, who no doubt, like a lot of rulers around the world, doesn't want to be on the bad side of the U.S. and uh, and is willing to go to extremes in some cases to keep the U.S. happy. And he gave apparently gave his consent to the strike on the ground on the 
condition that some kind of cover story would be devised to account for what happened to the people, and then Wolfowitz went and blew the whole cover. To, to, to flesh that out for us. That's exactly what happened. Uh, Saleh collaborated with the United States throughout his presidency in Yemen and basically gave them free reign to kill whomever they wanted to on Yemen sovereign soil. At the time of the November 3rd, 2002 strike, the agreement was this is a covert operation. There's going to be some sort of cover story. It's going to be accidental. But then Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz decided to vaunt the strike as a sort of victory in the war on terror. And it was a huge political success. I mean, everyone thought, oh, this is so wonderful. We can get rid of these evil terrorists without uh, harming our soldiers, without sacrificing our soldiers. And everyone thought it was a great idea. Um, Saleh was, I believe, uh, perturbed about the revelation because, of course, it was not favored by uh, his constituents. I mean, he basically was acting as a monarch and um, allowing the United States to kill anyone they wanted to on Yemen soil. And so, yeah, it was a little bit tricky, but Saleh actually collaborated, continued to collaborate with the United States and uh, lots of drone strikes were taken were carried out in Yemen up until the coup, the recent coup, uh, which I believe was precipitated by the drone campaign because there was just so much unrest and so much anger over the central authorities' uh, provision to the United States of the permission to kill all these people. Um, but yeah, exactly, it was covert. So in chapter two, I talk about from black ops to standard standard operating procedure. No one talked about these drone strikes between that strike, November 3rd, 2002, um, which was discussed openly by Paul Wolfowitz and then everyone else talked about it. But then, be then up until January 2012, no one talked about them. If you ask the administration, they all said, oh, we can't talk about it, you know, state, state, um, state secrets privilege, you know, we won't talk about it, we can't talk about it, we can neither deny or confirm that these people have been killed, you know, when people brought forth data about collateral damage, et cetera. They, they just consistently denied it. And it was ironically President Obama himself in a Google Talk chat in January 2012 in, in advance of the presidential election that he started talking about it. And so they said, oh, I guess, you know, people were like, oh, wow, I guess it's not really covered anymore, now it's over. <laughs> um, but, of course, he... He used this to paint himself as strong on defense. Look what I'm doing to keep you safe. And uh, since then, people have just accepted it. Uh, everyone in the administration accepts it. Certainly anyone who, is, who remained in the administration uh, has been a, a lethal drone advocate um, from, from 2002 on. A lot of people left the CIA, uh, but the people who have come in are all enthusiasts. And so now it's just considered standard operating procedure. Naturally, somebody's going to ask you, what do you recommend instead? we got a lot of bad guys out there. It's not always easy to apprehend them, and some of them do wish us ill, and it's quite clear in what they say that they wish us ill. So we have to do something. Yeah, I'm not so sure that most of these people are so close to Osama bin Laden. The problem is we're conflating all of these groups. Okay, there are militants, there are dissidents, there are terrorists, there are all these different types of people who are angry out there. A lot of the people being killed are actually militants whose aspirations are very local. And the central government authority, in a case such as Yemen, is using it, his collaboration with the United States to eliminate political enemies. These are people who would never make it to U.S. shores, most of them. Even if they hate the United States, as some of them may do, may, may very well because of our ongoing interventions, they don't have the means to, to, to harm the United States. That They're not, as the politicians always want to say, a, an existential threat. It's just preposterous to claim that they are. These people are not Osama bin Laden, but unfortunately, they've all been conflated into a single group of evil terrorists. And look at the cases of Afghanistan and Iraq. A lot of those people perceived themselves to be defending themselves against the occupiers, and they were. Now, they ended up joining, joining ranks with al-Qaeda terrorists, some of them, but in fact, a lot of the men killed really perceived themselves to be defending their own homeland. And what has happened since then is that everyone is just sort of thrown into the same barrel. They're all evil terrorists akin to Osama bin Laden. I reject that premise. I think it's false. I think it's politically palatable because politicians can say, oh, look at all these people we've killed, we're keeping you safe, when in fact the blowback is going to come, is going to come later down the line, and we, the, the tax-paying citizens, are the ones who are going to uh, suffer as a result of these programs. 
Now, you point out here what a number of people have said, which is that we have examples of people who have who have uh, taken up arms in one way or another as a result of a drone strike and the loss of a, of a relative or some close person, and they cite that expressly, and, they, and these are people who hadn't been involved in anything before. That's right. So there is the concern that are you, in fact, you kill one person and you radicalize two. There's a huge amount of data for this. I mean, lots of NGO groups and human rights groups have gone into these territories and interviewed people. A very recent study by Akarama, based in Switzerland, found in Yemen in the fall of 2014 that among the people living under lethal drones, there were forms of collateral damage which are really not acknowledged by the administration. The administration likes to say that collateral damage is body count. And, uh, and if you consider that collateral damage is exhausted by civilian body count, it looks like, oh, drones are a great idea because the body count is very low relative to full-scale wars. It's somewhere between several hundred and several thousand. People differ on the stats, and it also depends on whether you exclude the possibility of a milita military male who is... Uh, sorry, a military age male as a civilian. But even the worst stats, even if lots of these people have, have uh, been civilians, the body count is in the thousands. It's not hundreds of thousands. And so people say, you know, what are you talking about? Of course, drones are the answer. Uh, but they're, ex they're completely ignoring these other uh, facets of collateral damage, which I refer to as second order collateral damage. Or, third, or even third order collateral damage. And second order collateral damage is the... The harm done to people who are not killed in the strikes, but they are left bereft of their loved ones, uh, their community members, their homes, their their vehicles, etc. Those people have been harmed by the drones, but they still they survive, and they're in many cases traumatized. Um, they are afraid for the future. What Alkarama found in their very insightful study is that both bereft survivors and people who have not lost anyone are equally afflicted by uh, psychological uh, ailments such as fear, anxiety, paranoia, and above all, anger. And what they found was that among these people in, in the communities where lethal drones hover, uh, young boys in particular, whether they have lost a family member or not, tend to become very angry about this. And they are prime candidates for signing up um, to join forces to undertake jihad in collaboration with some of these terrorist factions. So absolutely, there's the question, are we creating more terrorists than we're uh, eliminating? And we have an abundance of, of evidence for this. And it actually seems just to be a matter of common sense. If you think about how you would feel if your own neighborhood were uh, being, I don't know, hit by missiles periodically, every now and then some, some house just disappears, and you're living there, well, what, these, what Alcarama found, and other organizations have, have, have corroborated this, is that the people have, a dif have difficulty planning for the future because they're not sure that they'll be here tomorrow. They have difficulty experiencing former sources of joy. They basically live in a sort of paranoid state uh, because they never know if they're going to be next in line. And as a result of this, some of the people are just traumatized and they're just psychological wrecks. Others become very angry and take up arms and vow to retaliate against this. Um, lots of the people, um, lots of the jihadists from the Bush era have said explicitly, as you, as you noted, that they are retaliating to the drone strikes and that they will not stop until the drone strikes stop. All right, I'm going to play devil's advocate again in just a minute, but okay. let's pause first for this message. Hey, all you good listeners, there are many reasons you might want to start up a blog or website. Maybe just a labor of love, or you want to join the conversation, or you want to show off your work and your portfolio to potential clients and employers. You could start a blog talking about all the great innovations going on at your company and have pictures of the company picnic up there and what so-and-so is up to at the company. That'll get you noticed. You won't be the first fired after that. Or a site about all the developments going on in your industry. That'll get you noticed by potential employers around the industry. So a lot of different ways you can do this, but you definitely want to do it. And because I'm one of a very small number of people who are VIP affiliates of Bluehost, I can get you the lowest rate they have on web hosting. And if you don't know what hosting is, you can find out about that in my free ebook. Get all of this stuff, the ebook, my video tutorial on this, and my publicity offer to get your blog off the ground at tomwoods.com publicity. 
All right. What I've heard is in response to this from time to time is for people who are worried about the the so-called blowback effects of U.S. intervention around the world, the answer is we didn't worry about that when we were fighting the Nazi regime in Germany. We didn't say, well, if we bomb them, they're going to get even angrier at us. We just leveled them. And you don't hear any more Nazis anymore. That would be what they would say. Well, if you want to undertake you know, full on genocide and kill all brown skinned people in these areas. Yeah, you will eliminate the problem of uh, jihadist terrorists. But we have to step back and ask what exactly we are doing, because in addition to killing the worst of the worst, the people who would, if they could grow up to be Osama bin Laden, we're also eliminating simultaneously the best of the best because we're eliminating people who are standing up against their central uh, central government authority often which are very tyrannical and oppressive. So we are actually eliminating the possibility of democracy arising in these places where we collaborate with central government authorities who allow us to kill whomever we like. And they are using it for their part to cement their position of power. So it actually, um, the story is very different when you look at it uh, from a longer range perspective. Let's take a, c a case such as Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mande Mandela was considered a terrorist by the South African government when he was thrown in prison where he stayed for 27 years. When he emerged, he was one of the greatest forces for peace in all of human history. Now, if lethal drones had existed, when Nelson Mandela was pegged as a terrorist by the South African government, he would have been destroyed. And what I believe is happening now is that we are destroying people who actually want to change their societies for the better uh, because we're lumping them all together into the same category of, you know, Os Osama bin Laden-like terrorists. In fact, there have been lots of terrorists throughout history who have had... Uh, positive programs. I mean, you could, if you want to talk about World War II, who were the uh, partisans in France, if not a group of civilian clothed dissidents, right? And uh, we ha you have to look at the, each particular case. It's not the case that um, anyone who opposes the central government of their land is automatically wrong and automatically evil. That's just a false premise. But it is a premise that we're taught to absorb because we are taught from American history that, of course, anybody who has ever stood up to the U.S. government for any reason has obviously always been crazy and always deserved what they got is the narrative that everybody gets in school and we stand up and salute and we pledge and, and so on and on. Now, what I like about this book is that it's not just – Although it would be great to have a book just specifically about drones and the the moral questions connected to it, but you you take a you, some very radical positions in here about in your discussions of the military itself as an institution, the culture of the military, the suicide and drug problems that we see with the the servicemen, the the difficulty of because of the nature of the military, having an opposing view and just following orders and so on. Can you tell us something about what you're driving at in that discussion in your book? Yeah, when I talk about uh, the drug use and the suicides, I am expressing concern that in part the the rampant prescription of drugs to both soldiers and veterans is having the effect of suppressing dissent among the troops themselves. So when you have someone like um, Brandon Bryant, who's an apostate drone operator, going around the world and saying, look, this is a mistake. We shouldn't be doing this. We're killing people. We don't know who they are. Um, we're killing women and children. He's, he's standing alone. Like There are no other drone operators, as far as I know, who are doing this. And uh, most of the people who are troubled by what they're doing in the military, whether they're drone operators or they're regular uh, soldiers, um, what happens when they're diagnosed with PTSD now in the 21st century is that they're, they're doled out a whole bunch of drugs. And tons of these uh, soldiers have tragically taken their own lives. No one's really looking into the, interactive, the interaction effects or the contributions made by the drugs to the soldiers' decisions to take their own lives. But what I want to say is that this, this new use of drugs has 
the effect of not only making it easier for soldiers to kill, but also suppressing the pangs of conscience which may emerge in them. And um, as a result of which some veterans always become opposed to war. Yeah, now that's, gosh, there's so much left, left <laughs> to talk about, and I feel like I've, I'm trespassing on your time here. I, I, I was really, really blown away by that video excerpt that we all saw several years ago that became known as, uh, it was called Collateral Murder. Yes. And this was Private Manning was yes. uh, helped to get that to us. And I, you, you know, anytime you see something like that where the people who are engaged in the killing are just moral monsters, there's no way to excuse the, their behavior, their speech, their obvious desire to kill these people. It, it, it's astonishing, but anytime you you point out a case like this, you get told, well, you know, there are always going to be a few bad apples. You know, it's it's a shame that we have a few bad apples like this. They say that, but in the case you cite, collateral murder, uh, the event was investigated by the powers that be, and they concluded that the soldiers had acted in conformity with their ROE, with their rules of engagement. So it's not a case of bad apples. They don't think that those people were bad apples. As a oh, I, so I'm sorry I didn't even realize that. Oh, yeah. I am sorry. Somehow I forgot about oh, that. Oh, no, that's that's what's even more appalling, that the people... So they're not even considered bad. They're perfectly good apples. Exactly. Those are the good apples. So if those are the good apples, what in the world are the bad? Apples, right? Well, can you describe, in case people have forgotten this, can you describe exactly what these good apples did? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, it's shocking. I, I have to say the first time I saw it, I kind of, I, I really felt sick to my stomach. Um, what happened was there were some Reuters journalists and civilians walking in, I believe it was New, the New Baghdad neighborhood of Baghdad, and some uh, soldiers above in an Apache helicopter, they interpreted the camera equipment which these guys were carrying as guns. They were, you know, AK-47s, they were RPGs. They were sure that these were insurgents, terrorists, whatever you want to call them. So they decided to take them out. They got the go-ahead and they shot these people. And uh, some of them were only wounded in the first round. And so one of them was reaching, was crawling, obviously, you know, severely injured, cr dragging himself along the, the ground. And one of the the soldiers in the helicopter was cheering him on, saying, come on, buddy, all you got to do is, is, gra is touch a weapon. So he was waiting for him to reach for, you know, his camera tripod, when in fact, <laughs> you know, thinking that it was a rifle, so that he could finish him off in conformity with his rules of engagement. So if you're reaching for a, a weapon, that means that you're still an active combatant and you can just, you know, whack the guy. So that's what's so, it was so disturbing because the guy exhibited this, thirst to kill an already wounded man. And, and I take this as indicative of a whole culture of killing, which I describe, as, which I label lethal centrism, the focus on killing more and more people as quickly and efficiently as possible, and also the use of body count as your sole measure of success. And so the collateral damage just illustrates all of these, these facets in the drone age. Yeah, th that wasn't a drone killing, but it, it, it exhibits the same sort of quest to kill that you find among quote-unquote well-adjusted drone operators. That's what they do. That's their profession. Their profession is to hunt down and kill people. They even say that they're hunting. Uh, so, so it's no longer a case that the military is trying to defend themselves because these drone operators are not in any physical danger. They're thousands of miles away, working behind screens and pushing buttons on joysticks to kill people who do not threaten them personally with any physical harm. And it, it, it radically changes things that the person who's involved in this has no risk to himself whatsoever. It changes the whole balance of the way war has been conducted in the past. I absolutely agree with you. It's a paradigm shift without question. The, these quote-unquote soldiers, the drone operators, cannot in any reasonable sense construe what they do as acts of literal self-defense. Now, of course... People who support the drone program say, well, yes, they are defending themselves and they are defending you because they're taking out these people who would kill us if they could. OK, that's the Obama line and the line of all the administrators. But the reality is that if you want to redefine self-defense that broadly, then what you're saying is that basically anyone can kill anyone by simply saying, oh, I'm afraid he might harm me in the future. 
I mean, this is a sort of this is a sort of rationalization which could be used by just paranoid people who take out their their local enemies because they they look at them suspiciously, right? So 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 it's it's like a preemptive war, but on an individual level. It's absolutely preemptive war, which makes it all the more shocking because Obama so harshly denounced Bush's preemptive war on Iraq. In reality, Obama has carried out preemptive war missile by missile with his drone program, killing people in in at least six, probably more countries, um, uh, without waging war, without declaring war, without consulting with Congress, um, and killing these people one missile at a time. It's a, it's a strange... Um, it's a strange situation where on the one hand they're saying it's war, on the other hand they're saying it's not war. So the reason why he doesn't have to go to Congress, you know, for example, in Libya, he said was because it's not, we're not endangering any troops, so therefore it's not really war. But it is war. And they, and they say that it's, it's war when it comes to collateral damage. So you kill innocent people and it, you, the answer is supposed to be, oh, fog of war, collateral damage is inevitable. But it's only war because they're using missiles instead of pistols or strangulation wires or poisons to kill these people. So it's a very strange um, case of sleight of hand, a sleight of linguistic hand, <laughs> you might say, where you, 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 call, you talk about it as war when that's convenient, and then it's not really war when that's inconvenient. Yeah, and well, this is how the regime operates in so many areas. Whatever it needs, you know, whether it was in the 30s, wh whatever program we need to pass, we'll call it this as long as that gets it through the Supreme Court. And once it does, then we'll call it the opposite. It, I, I, you can't trust anything they say on anything. I want to do two more things before I let you go. First is I want to read the very last paragraph before your post-face part, a uh, very last paragraph of your book because it's so arresting. Supporters of the Predator drone program effectively affirm that war is the conjunction of thousands of summary executions carried out by the decree of the commander-in-chief. War makers choose to wield deadly force while claiming that it is a last resort. When all of the measures under consideration are lethal, drones may be selected as the seemingly lesser of a variety of evils. But drone operators themselves earn handsome salaries for suppressing their own conscience and dispatching human beings whom they have never met and who never threaten them with death. Remote control killers situated far from the battlefield know deep down inside that no one would have died on that day at that place had they declined to fire on what became their victims. The brutal and merciless extermination of unwitting suspects denied the right to surrender or appeal because they are assumed to be vermin destroys the bodies of the victims while corroding the souls of their killers. Whoa. <laughs> That's a paragraph. That right there is a paragraph. I would – well, I think in this – in a way, our whole conversation has been a, a, a reflection on that paragraph. But I want to close with this, what may be a difficult question for you. You point out uh, – and forgive me if I, I'm, I have an addled middle-aged brain, but I feel like at some point in this, I read that you sent some, some writing of yours to, at that time, Senator Obama. And so that he, you know, because he seemed to be on board with a, a more peaceful foreign policy. And then you're horrified to discover that he turns around and engages in this sort of drone program. I want to ask you point blank were you an Obama supporter? And what kind of uh, evolution has taken place in your mind since his election? Well, yes, you are right. Um, you did correctly recall, I, I wrote in the preface that I had sent Obama an essay called The Strange Case of Summary Execution by Predator Drone, uh, which I wrote right after the November 3rd, 2002, annihilation of six men driving down a road in Yemen by the CIA. I sent it to the newly placed president. I sent it at the very beginning of January 2009. Um, okay. Obviously, it never made it to his desk. <laughs> Uh, and I, and and I did vote for him. I at that point, the reason why I sent it to him is because I had been seduced by this whole slogan of hope and change, and I was like, "Great, we're going to turn the corner on this Bush nightmare." Um, and and then as the years went on and went on, um, it became clear that Obama, in fact, was continuing much of the Bush um, much of the Bush Bush program, although not quite as brazenly he wasn't as he wasn't as open about it he was more secretive about the things that he did um so yeah i did vote for obama and um 
I was really appalled when I learned that he was a part of the kill committee that met on Tuesday, on Terror Tuesdays uh, to consider, quote unquote, flashcards about nominees to the kill list. That was really shocking. That was as sickening to me as the collateral damage video. To, I'm sorry, the collateral murder video. Um, and I really felt that I didn't understand what had happened. You know, it, it was incomprehensible to me that that he had transformed in this way. But I think what happened in retrospect is that he retained a lot of the Bush administration officials. And so when he asked them for advice, they told him, oh, you should do these things, which were, of course, the things they had already been doing, including drone killing. So my answer is that he's not the man I thought he was when I voted for him. That there's there's no disputing the fact that he's a completely different creature. Um, I thought that he was going to be a strong leader who would stand on principle. I now believe that he really doesn't have a kind of inner critic and that he's easily swayed by stronger willed advisors. And that's how we have ended up with a president who in some ways seems to be contradicting himself left and right. He'll say he's yeah. right. He's opposed to this. Because I think I think he's conflicted. I think in his own mind, he's conflicted. Well, he's accepted the advice of people whom he should have never listened to, beginning with John Brennan, who was the, who was the drone killing czar, whom he gave apparently an office in the White House. And uh, then later, uh, you know that Brennan advocated torture under Bush. So Brennan not only was not prosecuted uh, for, for, for his part in the torture, uh, but he was promoted to the head of the CIA. So, of course, since he was the drone killing czar, then drone killing became literally the only game in town. That's what these guys do now. And so I feel like Obama's huge mistake was to accept those sorts of figures as his top advisors, because, of course, they have a range of ideas about what is feasible and what's doable and what is good to do. Um, and of course, they want to promote what they have already been doing. I talk about this in the book as institutional homogenization, uh, which results because in part, there's a psychological need for these people to convince themselves that what they're doing is right. And so they do it more and more. And then after a while, what happens, as did happen in the case of drone killing, is it becomes standard operating procedure. Now, that's what we do, you know, even though we've never really examined it. I don't know if you're familiar with a writer named Diana Johnstone. Uh, she writes for Counterpunch quite a bit, and she has a, a book out called uh, Queen of Chaos, The Misadventures of Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. And she's attacking Hillary Clinton, you know, not because she doesn't want to raise taxes, you know, she wants to raise taxes or something, but she's criticizing her for being a, an interventionist in foreign policy, being a, a hawk on foreign policy. And I had her on, and I said, and we talked about Obama, and she agreed with me. She felt like if you compare him to Bush, he does seem less inclined to go to war, and he does seem like he wants to negotiate and so on and so forth. And she said, but she did feel like he's easily swayed, and he gets, as you say, swept away by people who are stronger willed than he is. And I said to her, and, and so she, it almost sounded like she was trying to excuse it. And I said, I can think of people who would have had a strong enough will, who no matter what the establishment is telling them or whoever's pulling the strings or whatever, they would have gone in there and said, I'm not bombing or I'm not doing this. I, I think Dennis Kucinich would not have done it. I think Ron Paul would not have done it. And she, she agreed and she said, but people who have that level of fortitude wouldn't have been allowed to get the nomination in the first place. And that, that just left my jaw on the floor. I thought, well, you know, I mean, I don't really know who, how people get nominations around here, but it always winds up being Bill Clinton or Bob Dole, and that's just what you're stuck with. It doesn't matter. It's going to be it's going to be Bill Clinton, and it's going to be Mitt Romney, and you're going to sit there and like it. And I don't know why it comes out that way, but it seems like it always does. Well, it, that is true, and I agree with your your other speaker about Hillary Clinton. I mean, Hillary's a hawk. That's that's been established. Um, you know, she was threatening Iran way back in 2008. But even in, I don't know if you watched the first Democratic presidential debate, she actually characterized the intervention in Libya as, quote, smart power at its best. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, because, you know, it's true, no soldiers were killed, but four State Department employees were killed. And then she went on to, in a way, blame the victim. She said, oh, well, you know, when you have these jobs, they're dangerous. <laughs> I couldn't believe yeah. it. <laughs> Oh, and not only that, but look at what look at what happened to Libya in the wake of it all. Like nobody even cares about that. I don't know what. See, that's to me, that was Bernie Sanders 
one of his 8,000 opportunities to basically decapitate Hillary right there and then. And for whatever reason, he just won't do it. I know. Um, but Bernie also, you know, although we may have hoped that he would be a different candidate, you know, he's come out openly and said that he w- he thinks that Obama is doing a good job on foreign policy and basically he would follow the Obama approach. And in fact, he used the expression drone assassination. He didn't say targeted killing. So you mentioned this earlier, how how we define redefine a term and then things just kind of slide together. And so now you don't even have to call it targeted killing. He said, I'm going to continue the drone assassination program. Bernie Sanders said this. He's the so-called progressive candidate. And the reason, I believe, is that he gets his knowledge of what is going on from the New York Times headlines. So he sees suspected militants killed. He doesn't know any of what's going on on the ground. Um, probably hasn't, you know, looked into Libya recently, as you said. <laughs> Libya is like a nightmare. It's, it's uh, uh, talk about, uh, you know, terrorist training camp waiting <laughs> Waiting to explode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, 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 you know, these are supposed to be, in theory, the best and brightest we have. Yeah. And, and I remember in 2008, John McCain was asked about the fact that he had, by his own admission, really not much knowledge of the economy. And he said, well, you know, I have Alan Greenspan's book. And like that was his answer. That was supposed to make us feel good. That was the best guy yeah. they could come up with. And it, anyway, I mean, it it, it just frustrates me to no end thinking back on those years that somehow because of ineptitude or or what it's not very well known but john mccain in new hampshire beat ron paul among anti-war people oh my now that is a messaging problem yeah. on, on mccain's part and on the ron paul team's part Definitely. anyway listen i want to recommend i want to urge people to check out this book i thoroughly enjoyed it it was recommended to me by robert higgs who's been a guest on this show a couple of times and who is very much admired by my listeners. The book is We Kill Because We Can, From Soldiering to Assassination in the Drone Age. We're going to link to it at tomwoods.com slash 538. Well, Laurie, I really, really appreciate your time. I kept you a little longer than I said I would, but I couldn't help myself. It was a great conversation. Thank you, Tom. I really appreciate it. That's going to do it for today. But remember, one week from today is Black Friday, and we're going to be having a big blowout with libertyclassroom.com. So if you know people who need to learn liberty, want to learn liberty, if you know students in your life who could use a lifeline to sane professors, it's the perfect gift for the liberty lover on your list, and we're going to have a super-duper deal on it such that you'll want to pick it up for yourself. And why not treat yourself, right? Be kind to yourself, too. So remember, that's the big deal going on on Black Friday at libertyclassroom.com. Also, I have a little bit of an advance notice that Rocket Languages, the foreign language program that I've promoted from time to time on the show, is also having a big discount. I think they're doing, they may be doing 60% off on Black Friday. So that's another thing to bear in mind, tomwoods.com slash rocket. So jot that down in your calendar for Black Friday, libertyclassroom.com, buy gift subscriptions and or one for yourself. And of course, Liberty Classroom is where you learn all this great stuff systematically, in all these areas, history, economics, philosophy, it's all there, all the stuff you want to learn taught by people you can trust, super great. And then also tomwoods.com slash rocket. You'll get all kinds of shopping done while just sitting at your computer. Ain't that the best thing ever? All right, another week is finished, and another glorious week begins next week. On Monday, it's another debate here on the show. We're going to be debating Bitcoin We're going to have a pro-Bitcoin guy and an anti-Bitcoin guy, and they're just going to go at it, and it's going to be fantastic. So make sure and subscribe so you don't miss it, and enjoy the weekend. See you later. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.